the doctor patient relationship, I really think is really one of being a coach and looking at the patient as a player and trying to champion that player to all of their potential. Uh, and, and so that, that, that's kind of like, um, really what I think is the most powerful way to have that kind of relationship. Similar, like as, as a lawyer, I tell my clients, you know, we have to work as a team. You know, I'm not given a magic wand or magic hat. I can't make stuff appear or disappear. Uh, we have to work together. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we've got a special guest, uh, Mr. Tony Martinez. Tony, how are you today, man? Hey, how's everybody doing today? Great to see you, Sean. Uh, well, likewise, Tony. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. I know we just likewise. chatted, chatted. I think about a week ago, so it's uh, yeah. it's always an honor. Um, likewise for me as well. Look forward when we can sit again across a table, enjoying another great steak. <laughs> yeah, if, if we're not forced to eat bug steaks instead, I'm I'm concerned about that. Uh, Tony, if you'd be kind enough just to just to give everybody your background, I know you've got a, a you know a, just a sort of a very compelling medical history, but also, you know, what you do as well is also very interesting. So if you wouldn't mind sharing so, that. I've been, I've been an attorney for the last 26 years. I've been involved uh, in the area of government relations, lobbying for like 30 years. Um, and um, I've always been involved in the area of health and nutrition. Um, in fact, I should have been a doctor. But I come from a family of lawyers and more as a tribute to my, my dad, rest in peace. Um, you know, we're, the Martinez family is a family dedicated to public service. So born and raised in New York, uh, educated in, in New York as well. Um, had the opportunity when I was a teenager to be a United States Senate page for the late Jacob Javits. That's how I got to learn how Congress and the government works. Uh, and then I became a lawyer. I was involved with the legislative strategy and the passage of the, what the law is called DSHE, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, um, which protected the nutritional supplement industry from FDA overreach. Um, and so, I have a background in healthcare policy, food and drug law. Besides being the regular, you know, lawyer, if you have a problem, you know, like uh, if I can help you, uh, it's within my capabilities. I that's what I uh, I try to do for people. Um, I unfortunately had a heart attack in this, in March of 2014. I had a um, history of type two diabetes. And despite the fact that I thought I was doing everything right, I just, you know, gradually progressed, got worse and worse until uh, I, I literally had a heart attack in March of 2014 and had a stent placement. And, and then I had recalled, you know, reevaluating my life and thanking God that I was still alive. Um, my friend and someone who I had the opportunity to work with, the late, great Dr. Robert Atkins, I said, why did I ever stray away from what he was talking about? Uh, and so um, I watched a documentary called Serial Killers with cereal like, you know. Breakfast cereal. cereal. Yeah. yeah, breakfast cereal. And so I just connected the dots and I said, aha, I said that I got to go. And I went low carb, keto. And the summer of 2014, I go on keto against my doctor's advice. I mean, I said, listen, I'm going to do this. And, and the doctor says to me, well, we got to check. You take your labs and everything. It sounds kind of really off the wall. I said, no, 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 no. Let's see. So the summer I start doing keto low carb, September, early September, I have my first set of labs. I have the first time I have a normal A1C in like, 14 years. And the doctor says to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm certainly not following the advice that you and the other doctors have been giving me. I said, what is going on? I said, well, listen, he says, good news. Um, I can take you off. Uh, I was taking Janamet, 
at the time. That's Genuvia and Metformin combination. And then that's when I always kid around and I say, in September of 2014, I stopped contributing to the $25 plus million salary of the CEO of Merck that actually holds the patent <laughs> on Genuvia. Uh, and uh, I've been keto since. And um, along those years, now coming on eight years, I have also started, uh, I listened to Patrick Toy, who's an engineer, and uh, he uh, developed a way and he um, stated and he published his own results. He did his own experiment with himself, how he cleared his, his arteries. He stopped coronary plaque progression. And uh, using a multivariate protocol, there's no way pharma could ever do this. This is the kind of thing that actually Rivera will be able to do or other enlightened companies will be able to do because of using multivariate approaches. But the, in my case, and I can only speak from my case, I can't say um, for other people, but by following this protocol, which I started in 2019, I did a baseline coronary calcium score. And while when you have a heart attack, if you have a stent placement, a uh, radiologist will not grade the area that has a stent, but they'll look at the other arteries. And I had a score in the uh, LAD or the famous Widowmaker artery of a 39. And uh, when I went back for the follow-up uh, last uh, October, same machine, same facility, everything uh, the score had dropped down from 39 to 30, and it was in the radiologist report. And my cardiologist had told me that she found it to be very, I only see my cardiologist once a year for an annual checkup. And she's like, you're my outlier patient. You're doing all of this keto, all this outlier stuff. And I keep saying, doc, it's the insulin. It's all these other things. It's not, it's, it's not the cholesterol. But anyway, so this got me on a personal level to be really focused on getting involved at a higher level and working with uh, good people like yourself and other uh, you know, companies and businesses that are trying to deliver real healthcare uh, to other people, you know, to, to people who have been dealing with chronic illnesses and really utilizing the power of food as the basis to make it happen. I, I know I'm speaking at length, but I'll stop now and, and pick up from there. Well, Tony, I mean, we want to speak at length. That's why you're here today. But let me just ask you, you know, so while this is going on, you know, you said it's not the cholesterol, it's the insulin, it's, it's something else, Doc. Two things I'd ask you, was your cholesterol considered traditionally high during the time you were reversing heart disease or what was? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh by the way, this is the other thing that was 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 fascinating. And so when I started the toy protocol, my cholesterol has been averaging between 200 and 250. So my my when I before I went for the follow up scan, my cardiologist and my patient says, you know, this cholesterol is high. You really should be on a statin. I said no. Um, um, I experienced side effects. Uh, I also was upset. You know, they don't tell people. The side effects of some of these cardio these cardiovascular drugs, particular, for example, some beta blockers. Um, there's some really uh, a very impactful quality of life side effects. Uh, so um, the so that even baffled my cardiologist and my primary care physician even more. Uh, you know, like how did how is it that you can stop? coronary plaque progression and still have this, what is now considered to be elevated in, uh, cholesterol. And I'm not on a statin. I actually take a combination of several supplements, um, L-citrulline, natokinase, um, fish peptides, uh, that sort of my, my uh, vitamin K, uh, D3, and the vitamin K is K1, K2, MK4, MK7. It's pretty comprehensive stuff. Um, the Patrick Toyd has a formula called concentrated K, and that's what I've been taking 
since 2019 on a daily basis. So my doctors were like, okay, keep doing what you're doing. I'm not, I can't argue with the data. It is what it is. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to argue with success. Um, yeah. During this time, I know you eat steak, Tony, because I've seen your pictures and I've had one with you. So, I mean. <laughs> well, I have a surprise for you. I'm going to be, we're going to be taking keto to the world. Uh, I mean, around the world international. We're going to be going into, we're going to be going to Spain very soon. And nice. you're going to be part of that. I, I'm, will. <laughs> I plan to go to one of the best steak houses in the world, a place called Casa Julian, um, where we'll have an event someday in the future. And hopefully you'll be one of the the, the featured speakers at that. I, I would, I mean, yeah. I'd be honored to do that. Olay. It's, 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 it's <laughs> tough to brag. I, mean, I was just in uh, California, you know, and they asked me what, what it would take to get me to speak there. I said, Hey, just feed me a steak and, you know, get me out there and I'll do it. No problem. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm pretty easy as long as I got steak. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about, well, the toy protocol, I, you know, I saw you know him and Ivor chatting about it two years ago and has he, has he changed? I know, I know I remember hearing about the magnesium and the, and the, and the and vitamin K and a few other supplements. Is there a dietary protocol that goes with that? Is it low carb? Is it keto? Yes. How, how yeah. It, it's low it carb keto. But I mean, what I really find both, fascinating and also stimulating creative is the way that Patrick describes the health system, the cardiovascular system, like using what I, what I quite use the term like a symphony symphonic approach. And he uses the, the great metaphors. It says, it's like, once you have an understanding of what's going on in, in your cardiovascular system, it's like there is a, there's a symphony and you've got to have the right number of musicians, the right number of instruments, the right composition to conduct all of the music correctly so that you can get it to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. And if you are, if you've been in an inflammatory process, a diseased process, it's about stopping that process and then reversing it. And it takes time. It does not happen overnight. It will take, and probably in most people's cases, it'll take years because the damage that we've experienced has occurred over so many years because of our lifestyle. And it's the combination of everything. It's the diet and the exercise and then our genes. You know, we're always up against that as well. So it's the combination of those things, but for me so far, so good. And I'm continuing the protocol and actually following, you know, it, it takes, it's a lot of supplements, but like, again, it's so far so good. Yeah. We should probably, we should probably interview Patrick if he's, if you think he'd be willing to, I mean, let me interested to talk. I, I can help set that up. I mean, I, we are, uh, he and I are, we can become very good friends. That would be great. That would be great. So Tony, I mean, you know, the critics would say, well, you know, 30, 39, you know, that's, that's a nine point, it, you know, and again, it's the same thing. It's not that big of a difference. You didn't have that much to start with, you know, it's, it's about a 20, you know, 25% reduction from where you were, but what about, you know, cardiac function? Because you got one study there. I mean, what, when you had your heart attack or prior to your heart attack, any difference in, you know, like we can look at things like ejection fractions. We can look at, right. look at, look at performance, you know, what can I do physically? If you've got a bad heart, you're not going to be performing as well as you could. Are, are you, can you object? Well, something else, something yeah, else right. that I did after, mm -hmm. after that, I mean, I did a cardiac stress test and I passed it. I mean, everything was fine. Um, the ejection fraction rating after my heart attack definitely went down, but I've recovered that since I've since recovered what I lost. Yeah. Uh, and so, like I said, my cardiologist, God bless her. Um, uh, she says to me, <laughs> you know, you're my outlier patient. I always, I always, I always find, I always enjoy seeing you. I go, I enjoy seeing you once a year too, doc. I want to keep it that way. Yeah. Well, or, or even less. We, most of us, most of us, I mean, most physicians are nice people and I like, you know, but, but I'd rather not see them, you know, it, 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 at least no, no, not no, in no. professional I mean, capacity. I, it, it's fine. I mean. You have to understand. In my case, I've had—I mean, I've had a heart attack and I've had a stent, so I have to be sensitive to that reality. Um, and that you know, it, it depends. Um, you, you know, you have to—you sort, you have to, you have to gauge how much involvement you have. And obviously, you want to be working with 
uh, doctors who at minimum won't get in the way of what you're trying to do if you're getting the results and absolutely be working with doctors who are empowering you and opening your mind because the doctor patient relationship, I really think is really one of being a coach and looking at the patient as a player and trying to champion that player to all of their potential. Uh, and, and so that, that, that's kind of like, um, really what I think is the most powerful way to have that kind of relationship. Similar, like as, as a lawyer, I tell my clients, you know, we have to work as a team. You know, I'm not given a magic wand or magic hat. I can't make stuff appear or disappear. Uh, we have to work together. And when we do that, the probabilities are in our favor for the best outcome possible. Tony, do you know, um, just, and, and I'm not going to spend too much more time here, but you know, uh, I know obviously Patrick has improved his cardiovascular, uh, calcification plaque. You, you won. There's probably, I've heard of several other, any idea on the number of people he's been able to actually demonstrate objective reversal? I, I think he, he will, he's best to speak to that because okay. again, this data is, or this information is probably private is private. Um, it's up to the individual to kind of to release it. I mean, I published, I, I posted on social media my my my, my CAC scans, the before and after. Uh, and so, uh, but but I he he has definitely um, anecdotes, and it's fascinating because it does make you consider that you know the goal after you have a heart attack is you don't want any more. Uh, obstruction. So stopping plaque progression is most important. But if you can reverse it, that's pretty significant as well. And um, the, the again, but the, the challenge is there's no way pharma, there's no single uh, you know compound that's going to do all of these things because it goes back to that that symbolism that I explained, the symphony, you got to have all the different instruments and the players, the music, all of those things. There isn't one. Let's so cholesterol is just like, you know, one of the, one of the actors in the play, but not, not even the main actor. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, you'd mentioned, we see more and more data coming out that's showing that it's not necessarily elevated cholesterol that's the main driver of heart disease is diabetes by far, like by tenfold magnitude. If you look at things like the Women's Health Initiative analysis and the NHANES data, and th well, I mean, there's a lot of studies that would show that diabetes. And you and you said, I've got it. My A1C is back down to a normal range, first time in who knows how many years, and that's that's very powerful. Yeah, I was 12 years old. My doctor was like, was like, because he hadn't seen it before. My primary was like, how did you do that? <laughs> Yeah, interesting. It's it's, it's I, the fact that they have to ask the question how you do that is a little a little frustrating because you should they should know how to do that by this point, but we don't. Well, you know, they would think that it would happen. You know, it was you know it was pharmacology only, but we know that there's limits to it, and it's kind of a false sale that you know that that's in, that a pharma makes. Well, if I take this medication. I can continue engaging in the behavior that made me sick right. and it won't be as bad. Well, there's some truth to that, but there, it gives a false sense of security to the, to the patient. And as far as all that pharma cares about on the bottom line is, Hey, we want this person alive as long as possible and taking our product for as long as possible. That's all they care about. I don't care. They're not interested in you getting off of their medication. Yeah, and that brings me to a good transition point. You know, as you know, pharmaceutical companies provide the biggest amount of federal lobbying dollars in the country. I think there's three pharma lobbyists per every member of Congress. I think I saw something like 1,600 pharma lobbyists. How do you go up against that? Because, you know, you said you, you've now taken money out of the Merck CEO's pocket, and I'm not sad about that. I mean, you know, but, you know, but they're not happy about that, and they won't be happy about that. So what is it? What is a strategy? Obviously, what we're going to be doing as a company and what we're doing already is going to impact that, you know, probably like we're a mosquito right now. But if you try to get something that you're significantly impacting these, these you know, these $100 billion companies, what do you see? Well, it comes, it, it comes down to this, 
you know, what I call is like, well, who's paying for this? So the, you know, when you, you know, when the taxpayer is paying for this, it's kind of this amorphous thing. We don't really realize that when we, when we're paying taxes, that that money's going into this pot of, you know, into this pot. And then in this pot is, you know, insurance is going to be paying for it. It makes its way down. But, you know, the fact that I can look at and say to myself, well, since I've stopped taking Janamet, you know, based on what I would have paid out of pocket over the last eight years, it's over $50,000. Now, that's real money. And what have I done? What I've been able to do by having those savings, I can now, I've been able to spend it on other things, including eating better food. Uh, and so uh, to, the, to make the case at the, at the government level really has to go down to um, showing, hey, we are spending X um, on healthcare and it's taking away all of this money from other things that we need. We know there are other things that government has to provide like infrastructure, um, security, uh, you know, research and development. If all the money's going to taking care of sick people, um, it deprives the state or the government from doing things. Now in New York, the state controller did a report back in 2015, 2016, showing that uh, the state of New York was spending like over a billion and a half just on diabetes related care. And that it was impacting the state's ability to allocate resources for other things that, that New York state needs. And so that can be the basis to get the attention of the politician. Because just because you've got three lobbyists, pharma lobbyists, on you at the end of the day, you've got to you got to make sure that the lights are on, the police are are doing their job, the mail is getting collect, collected and sorted, the road, you know, all those things that government does. So when we don't have infinite resources and people don't, uh, you know, uh, people are are aren't thrilled, uh, especially these days, wondering what are we getting, what is the value that we're getting for the government services that we're paying for. So this is that combination. I don't see it as an insurmountable thing. Um, I think it will change also if we were a, if we would be able to get rid of uh, corporate uh, financing of elections, um, taking out the distortion of money out of politics and equalizing it, um, the making financing more public or public, that will take the advantage that pharma has had. Yeah, they have an enormous advantage. And, you know, one of the things, you know, you're in New York. And I can't remember if you're, you're – are you in the city, Tony? Are you in New York City as well? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Westchester County. Okay. Uh, like, but, I mean, it's like just right outside. I'm, I'm about 45 minutes from Manhattan. Yeah, because you're – you're well, in, in New York City, you know, the mayor, Eric Adams, is now pushing for a – what do you call yeah, it? Plant, plant-based he, centered life or whatever whatever kind of nonsense. Well, he, he, he had a with. coming to Jesus moment with his own health. And God bless him. I know Eric Adams. I met him. Um, but, you know, going vegan, vegan worked for him. And it's it made him, like, you know, go off the deep end uh, on this. I never tell people when I tell them my story that they have to do what I'm doing. I simply share with them and say it's an option. And the fact that, you know, I happen to like to eat meat, beef. And I, you know, I expect to eat it to all the rest of my life. So I want to be, you know, I want to be able to do it in a way that supports my health. And I do that. So, I mean, we shouldn't impose it. We should simply say it's an option. And I just don't, I don't agree with the vegans. So, you know, if I was to see Eric today and tell him, you know, we, I, I don't agree with meatless Mondays, meatless Fridays. I think it's crazy. Get rid of the processed food that our kids are 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 getting. Get rid of the skim milk that you know you're giving to school children. Go back to whole milk. I mean, for goodness sakes, 
th- there are textbooks, you know, how to fatten cattle by giving them cereal and skim milk. And like we as human beings or mammals, th- that's the exception. I remember breakfast cereal companies, you know, advertising, you know, the, you know, eat the, eat the cereal with skim milk and you'll get strong and thin and all that. It's all BS. Yeah, it's the the low fat dogma, which is still pervasive despite all of the, uh, you know, the negative negativity we've seen. That it's it's just so powerful, and it's it's you know it's obviously funded by the message yeah. is obviously funded by companies that stand to benefit from this sort of messaging. Um, you because uh, you, you mentioned you know public uh, funding for elections. I know you were trying to run for state assemblyman, I believe state senate, uh, state, state senate. senate yeah. Okay, yeah, but but COVID nineteen ruin that. And then they, they just finished rewriting the districts and I'm at a kind of a different place. Uh, at, at the moment, I'm not looking to get my hat, um, back in the ring, but I certainly, um, I'm helping people who want to run for office. Gotcha. Gotcha. I just want to point out Nancy, one of our members says she's in Columbia County. So I guess somewhere near you, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with the New York. Sure. Uh, it's just, uh, just a little bit north up next, from Westchester on the way up to Albany, you pass Columbia County. Uh, where you know when, when you i mean what i you know i i you know, obviously i can't be ex- help but be exposed to all the the media is coming out there uk wanting to feed their kids bugs to green the planet and i mean it's literally the stuff we it's see so crazy it's, it's really every, every it, single it, day it's really it's really crazy how much are people buying into that at, at the level of the, of the policymakers? Are they are they all on board with this stuff, or, or what's a, what's a, what's a, what's the climate look like? Well, you know, I always say to people, put yourself in that legislator or policymaker shoes. They have to do something. Um, you know, we have to ask ourselves how real is the problem. And some of it is quite real and some of it is exaggerated and some of it is is not is not emphasized enough really requires a lot of discipline and thoughtful process and uh i just say at this point um then now 50 am maybe 59 in december um this is it, it sometimes you know it may be the smartest thing to do is to just wait, not necessarily go into reaction, but really gather all the information and then respond. Um, but we do our, we are going to have to do something about climate change. We are going to have to do something about food, but it comes back to like, so for example, most people don't realize that meat in the United States is controlled by four processors. That is essentially an oligopoly and oligopolies like monopolies are bad because they distort the capitalist system from being focused on providing diversity and price competition and creativity to controlling the market for the interests and restraining competition to protect the economic interests of those players. So it's the job of the government to use the power of antitrust to make sure that there is a level, fair playing field. And this is the problem now that we have, for example, with meat, that there are four processors. Family farmers aren't even featured. Um, There's difficulty to access access them. There's difficulty to access uh, information on on prices and product availability, you have to go to the, you know, the farms, uh, the the weekend uh, local farming fairs, and you know, hope that you know if you do your research on the internet. But for the average consumer, they're not getting all of that. So we have these are the things that we have to change. We have to look at our food policy to become more locally reliant and empowering and supporting those family farmers than having this kind of global international strategy, eating these foods that are not even seasonal or coming from all over the place um, and disrupting the the marketplace 
to have what we have now. Yeah, I mean, if you look, I think it was 1921 Stock, Stockyards and Packers Act, which is on the books, and, and they don't enforce that. So it's one of these, you know, things that uh, I've seen people complaining about that with the four, you know, the four major beef pack, beef beef processors, and then you had Smithfield from, you know, which is owned by China, I believe, and they they control most of the pork production in the U.S. Um, I, you know, it seems like to me, one of the criticisms I have is I see a lot of lip service, a lot of people just talking, you know, I see in Congress, you know, you, you'll see some Senate hearing, you'll see the, the Senator yelling at the person and then never, nothing ever gets done though, Tony. It's just like they get up there and they, they, they well, we need term limits. That's yeah. another thing that needs to be brought into, I mean, because the simple fact that we have people that have been in Washington for decades, uh, then that becomes sort of a kind of a form of a monopoly or oligopoly. You know, I'm trying to help a, a candidate who's running for the U.S. Senate uh, in in another state, and it's just astounding what he's up against in terms of uh, party elites and the fact of income, the power of incumbency. You know, we need to go back to having fair competition. Um, everybody playing by the same rules. Everybody having access to uh, truthful information. Um, if we're not. We're we're not in a very good place right now, unfortunately. And this is why we have the problems that we're all experiencing right now, and why it's so important. And I think everybody that's on this podcast congratulations because i know you're like part of that group of people that is so concerned about your own health and taking charge and getting involved you know this is the kind of community that will actually lead the way and find the solutions that everybody else is looking for yeah i i do think you know just because of conflict of interest and you mentioned there's not a big incentive to cure a disease there's not a big incentive to get people truly healthy it's more let's just kind of maintain them in their state of disease with a little bit less misery maybe we can we can mask some of the symptoms and just kind of milk them out for for profit for you know 30 or 40 years until they finally drop dead right. that that unfortunately is a reality and i think you know i thought i think i think goldman sachs did an analysis of the pharmaceutical industry when they asked the question is curing people a bit a sustainable business model, and their conclusion was no, it's not. And so that's kind of what you see. You that's a very warped uh, idea of mentality and a distortion of what our country should be about, what capitalism should be about. You know, it's like these are extremes that are not are not in the best interests of the country. How can anybody anybody say that it's in, that it, it doesn't make sense to get people healthy? Once we have people that are healthy, I mean, the the ability to be more productive grows exponentially. The quality of life grows exponentially. Yeah, I think when we talk about sustainability, because we hear nothing, you know, we hear so much about sustainability, you know, all these companies are sort of sort of virtue signaling their sustainability by, you know, various different methods. But I mean, healthy people are sustainable and, and unhealthy people are not sustainable. You know, exactly. you know, you look at the, you know, you look at the greenhouse gases that the healthcare industry puts, that's like 10% of our greenhouse gases, which is a huge, huge part, not to mention how much money it costs. And so, Sick people are not sustainable. I think that's a message messaging that I'd like to see um, put out there. And I don't know that we're doing that. I mean, we're seeing, I just look at the stats on childhood mental illness. It's gone up 31%, I think, from 2006 through 2018 or something like that. I can remember the year of that. But And it's probably even higher now after COVID. Um, right. And, and the, the, the further uh, devolution of our diet, I, wouldn't, I guess, well, I mean, maybe evolution into more processed food. It's, it's very, very frustrating. Um, does, you know, and, and again, you know, we're all aware there was this horrible, horrible, horrific, uh, shooting in Texas. And, you know, there's, of course, there's the arguments about, you know, gun control versus not, but at the same time, we're ignoring, I think some of the role nutrition has on mental health. I mean, I think, well, oh, uh, absolutely. I, I will have the opportunity to be at the metabolic health, uh, the symposium and summit in Santa Barbara earlier, uh, this month in May, and it was a great conference. 
And one of the mantras that came out of that conference, which I really, really liked, was that mental health is metabolic health. And that really is, should be the policy goal, metabolic health. We wanted to have a concept or a goal to, to get around, to align, align behind its metabolic health, because metabolic health addresses the physical and the mental health challenges that most of us have. And um, we know, a lot of us know anecdotally from either our own experiences or people that we have met in this community where their mental health or mental health issue was resolved by changing what they were eating. And without having to have a pharmaceutical intervention. Yeah, absolutely, Tony. And that's something, you know, I, I've been, you know, kind of, as you know, I've been talking about this stuff for years now. And I mean, it's great that we can say, hey, low carb diets impact diabetes. And we've got, you know, uh, you know, that that message is, is, is pretty well becoming accepted by at least a significant percentage of the population. But the fact that it also fixes mental health, it also fixes autoimmune issues, it also helps with arthritis, it also helps with blood pressure and all these things. I think we, we just have to sort of get out there and, and, and not be afraid to, uh, you know, talk about this, even cancer. I mean, there's an impact on cancer. Nutrition has a role in, in cancer. I mean, I, I know it's, I know that's a delicate topic and for some reason, cancer, same thing, mental health and cancer have these stigmas around them, but you can't talk about them. But I mean, like any other health condition or physiology, it's all impacted by nutrition. And hopefully we'll get more and more of that. I know, and you know, I know you are familiar with Chris Palmer's work. Yeah, I think he was yes. there. I think he was there. And yeah, he was there. He he, yeah. he he was the one. He he was the one who uh, who stated it at, at at the conference. God bless him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chris is a Chris is a great guy. I've interviewed. Had the opportunity to visit with him, or at least interview him. Uh, one, I think once or twice. I'd like to do that again because he's continuing to fight the good fight out there at Harvard. But um, do you uh, you know where do you see the role of government? Because uh, many of us, you know, we're, we're frustrated with the government. We're like, man, they, they're not helping me out. They're just, they're just kind of, you yeah, know, they're in the way, they're in the way kind of thing. Yeah. Where, where, where can we turn that around? Because they're not going away. They're still there. And I mean, well, well we need, we need government. I mean, we can't operate without right. some kind of government. Um, I'm, I, you know, and, and, and these issues that we're dealing with, like with guns, for example, is, is, you know, we're, we're in it. We're at a point really, and this is, I would say in an existential crisis where we're trying to figure out wh where does this fit or how is it supposed to fit? You know, uh, like with guns, what are, are there any limits to guns? What are they? It, what rights are, are there any limits? Are they absolute? We're struggling with that as a country. And it's the same thing that we're dealing also with health because I simply say that we, it's incumbent upon us to be the engineers of changing that system of favoring and profiting from sickness and disease to changing that to rewarding and empowering good health. You know, we need to be empowering the doctors who get the diabetes reversals. We need to be giving them the financial rewards. You know, with, it's all about where are the rewards, uh, the, you know, carrots and sticks. Well, right now, all the carrots are, are, are on the sickness side of the, of the ledger. There's no carrots on the health side. Of it. So we have to change that. We, the only way to do that is step by step. All politics is local. You start at your local community, your town your district, your assembly district, state senate district. Um, and then it goes up because the federal government uh, can only do so much. Health is regulated in part by the federal government, but the practice of medicine is regulated by the states. Insurance is regulated by the states. The only contrast to that is you have uh, Medicare, uh, which is a federal program, and 
um, the practice of medicine is not regulated by the federal government, but the federal government can influence it in a positive way because the federal government provides money and resources to the individual states. And by implementing policy saying states that have these kinds of programs, we're going to allocate more funding to you. So that's going to, you know, every state's going to want more money. Like, okay, what do we got to do so that we can get our fair share of whatever that federal money is? That's kind of the dynamics that we have to go on with. And we also need to be looking for new people to run and, and get elected. You know, how many people listening out there in this audience ever thought about running for office? You know, the idea of public service is for a time, not a lifetime career. You know, if I had the opportunity to be a, a congressman or a senator, I absolutely would put a term limit on myself. I would only going to be there to do whatever I say I'm going to do. And then, you know, I step aside and move away for somebody else. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, who, I mean, when we think about like, you know, I, I, I'm obviously very opinion on what I think we should do with health. I mean, I think we're not measuring the right things. I think the, the metrics need to change. I think the methods need to change. Who do you got to talk to though? I mean, how do you, how do you, I mean, who's the guy? I mean, who are the people? Who do you got to, who do you got to, who do you got to convince? Uh, well, it, it's about, it's, a, it's really incumbent upon the individual to create a relationship uh, with an established a relationship with the people that represent them and serve them. I mean, it's as simple as, you know, and we live very busy, very hectic lives, very stressful lives, but how many people go to town meetings? How many people even make requests of their elected representative's office? Even more so, how many people know um, their local officials, uh, local police department, local ambulance court? We all have to be doing a little bit more in these areas so that we can connect. And people will always be interested in hearing these stories because I'm sure everyone in this audience has a compelling story or an anecdote that really should get anybody in a responsible position with authority to go, gee, this is interesting now. How is it that this guy or this woman um, is no longer on taking this prescription medication or is looks 180 degrees different from when I last saw them? What the heck did they do? Uh, and then also when they hear stories that, well, this was done eating meat uh, or eating a high fat, low carb diet, this is... It, it does give people pause to think. And we have to be repetitive. Can't give up. Got to be out there. Keep repeating the message or your experience, sharing your experience, because someone will be interested and take note of it. Yeah, when you you mentioned you'd work with Robert Atkins uh, back yes. back in the day, and he, he came up against a lot of... Uh, opposition i mean he was he was vilified uh and i don't know if the climate today has either better or worse i mean we may have more science but we now have the save the planet sort of thing and we should all cut back on eating meat and uh so what do you think the climate today versus what atkins faced back in the 70s and 80s uh compared to what's well, going on now well the animus against all of this was always there but bob was was both uh charismatic very charismatic man, very colorful. In his language, he said, Todd, very creative. Um, before he passed, um, tragically in that accident in front of his clinic, um, I had the opportunity to be with him. And I always remember when he said to me, Tony, I've, I've coined this term, diabesity. <laughs> That's what he would call it, diabesity. And he showed me a PowerPoint and um, I had, at the time I was in, living in Washington and I was able to facilitate an introduction between him and then the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, who was in the uh, George W. Bush 
uh, administration was one of his health and human services secretary. And they were going to meet and the secretary said, come on in. I want to hear all about your diet and everything. There was, a, there was always, in, there was interest. And then he had that terrible, uh, tragic accident and that went. But I mean, there's always going to be people um, who challenge this. I mean, because this isn't what they were taught. This isn't what they were uh, or this isn't what their understanding was of the science. And here we are, uh, people coming up with histories and cases and uh, that conflate everything that um, these other Orthodox people um, were led to believe, you know. So uh, the, the, the key is, is to be consistent. I can say to you, Sean, as Rivero begins its its business journey, it's going to encounter challenges. It's going to push up against um, competitors, but also perhaps I can see it sometimes in government or regulators because it's it's going to be doing things differently, and it's going to be getting results that will call into question other results. And but you know. At the end of the day, if people's lives are being improved uh, by the services and products that the company are providing, hey man, all you know, all, all blessings to you, all the way. You deserve it. That's that's what it's about. Yeah, Tony. I mean, and ultimately, the the reality is a lot of this is about going to be about money, and it's going to be whose money. Who is, who is incentivized to have healthy people? I mean, other, the people, obviously, I mean, I, no one wants to be sick. No one wants to be on medications, but at the end of the day, somebody's got to be incentivized financially for this. Where do you go? Is it the government? Can we say, Hey, we can save you. We can cut that $3.5 trillion in chronic disease spending down in half uh, by doing something like this, or is it, is it corporations or where, where do you see that playing out? But you see, if you're going to make the argument that you can cut these costs, okay, where is that money going to go back to, which is a practical is it going to go back to the taxpayers? It's going to be reallocated to something else that has been kind of left on the wayside. You know, we have serious infrastructure issues, for example. Um, we have a debt. We, you know, there's anybody in government can pick a whole host of things where that money could go to. And if you can show that it can be done, um, then you will get. Um, certainly some buy-in. And you're also going to get buy-in immediately from those officials that have the personal experience uh, that, uh, you know, either they're either they themselves or someone they know, a friend or a relative that has that story. Cause that's how it's all, that's how all of this stuff is really driven. It's always driven by personal experience. Yeah, it's not hard to, to 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 put a talk together in a room full of even five or ten people and say, who do you know that has diabetes? Who do you know that has chronic disease? And every one of them is going to know a sister, a cousin, a mom, a brother, a friend. Everyone knows this. We're all touched by this. So it's not hard to make it personal for most people, which is it's the nice thing, but it's also the bad thing because it's so common. Uh, and I, I agree. I mean, that's what I've been doing from the beginning, showing people – these people getting better over and over and it's led to, you know, what we're doing now and hopefully continue to lead to more. Um, where it'll be really important for, uh, practitioners like yourself or you know, for any of the practitioners to be, keep putting out the case histories. Very important because right now that's, uh, you know, until there are more studies being done and the kind of studies that, um, look into this, uh, you know, demand that the NIH research some of this stuff, because again, there isn't a financial incentive for a company to get off of these things. That's kind of like the dark side of this is that there isn't the incentive. You know, so we have to create that and kind of force those incentives. You know, if you keep showing uh, you know, your patients that you're, you've put all of these number of X number of patients uh, into dietary remission from diabetes, 
or whatever the chronic condition is, eventually it's going to get somebody's attention in a good way, not in a bad way, in a good way. Only your competitors will get upset by that. Go, oh my God. You know, but and it, 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 is a comp- it is a competitive playing field. We have to compete to get the attention uh, of the policymakers and the people. You know, a lot of people don't even know that this is even an option. Like what they just did with the dietary guidelines, totally ignored the low carb aspect. Why, why, mean, why, why is that, Tony? Why do they keep ignoring it? What do you think? I mean, is, is it, you know, is there, it there's conflicts of interest at the USDA? Agenda, yeah. uh, uh, the people on that committee, uh, you know, everybody doesn't want to upset the apple cart. There's also one other kind of a contextual problem from a government standpoint. And that is the regulation of food has been bifurcated between the Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration. So you don't have that focus on healthcare that you have on all other aspects, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, uh, because nutrition has been kind of split between the business and economics, which is what the USDA does, and then the kind of the health and wellness side, which is what FDA is supposed to do, but it's sort of mixed. And FDA's mission is to always keep bright lines, distinctions between foods and drugs and regulate them like that. And we may, we may have to take a, a look at that. Not may have to. We have to take a look at seeing how, how that has not uh, necessarily been in our best interest as a country in the year 2022. Maybe that might have worked. In the, in the 20th century, but for the 21st century, you know, medicine and healthcare is moving along it's like what Rivera was doing, getting more precision based. Uh, and it's going to need the tools and the resources to deliver those results. Some of these, these large regulatory agencies, CDC, well, it's not CDC, but FDA, uh, USDA, uh, we, we see regulatory capture going on. You know, we see that, uh, you know, the drug companies fund 65% of drug approvals. I mean, they literally fund it from through the FDA. Well, Congress passed an FDA user fee act. So it's, uh, you know, that's sort of the, the downside to that model is instead of Congress allocating the money for FDA to do these drug approvals, um, they basically said FDA charge the fees that you feel the necessary to timely expedite reviews of new drug or medical device applications. And so, you know, we have, you know, we have these fees and then these fees fund the bureaucracy and the bureaucracy wants to keep sustaining itself and grow the employees. And this is kind of the same organizational behavior that we have in government in general. We have to we have, you know we have to you know rethink that perhaps. But then the reason why we had those user fees in the in the first place was because drug approval times were lagging. But again, how how quickly we have to be as a country, you know, look at diabetes drugs. We're just getting different generations of the same type of drugs. We're not really getting anything that cures, we're just getting symptom, you know, remediation, and we're not really addressing the problem. That's, again, you got to have the right people in office, and you have to be asking the right questions, and the community has to be engaged. Do you, is there anyone you personally know that actually is the right person, is actually doing the right thing? I mean, I can't think of, I cannot think of a a center or congressman, and I don't know them all. I, I, I don't have. I you them. know, the people that I know that would, were key, that cared about this stuff are no longer in Congress or have retired. I mean, or passed away. And, uh, but uh, but I do know that you know whoever is going to be representing us. 
lobbying for us uh, has to be someone who has the ability to identify and engage and create relationships with those people in office. You know, for example, uh, there's a diabetes caucus in Congress. You know, it would be nice, maybe someday when Rivero gets going, Rivero has a luncheon, uh, has, a, has a briefing and explains to Congress, here are all the ways that we can impact and reduce the cost of diabetes and using food. Or these are the programs that we are utilizing. And it gets serious too, because some of these diseases are impacting our armed forces and our ability to our security. Uh, so this is something that, you know, it has to be done. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I say to it, we, our attitude should be, here is a new opportunity. Here is a new landscape that we really need to plant our flag. Because somebody else is already, you know, you know, competing for that. Yeah, amen to that, Tony. And I agree. I think that's something, you know, as I look down the road of where we're going to be going, we're going to have to sort of reach out to a lot of people to get a lot of allies. Um, Tony, unfortunately, I'm running out of time on this. We got an hour. And I, so tell folks where to go to find out more about what you do. I know you got some social media. If All right. So else on Twitter, you can find me, follow me at, at USAMBCUBA, USAM Cuba. Uh, also very soon you will see the name or moniker Keto Tony. So when you see Keto Tony, hashtag Keto Tony, that's me. Or if you want to clue me into something, you can put out hashtag Keto Tony, uh, email address, AC Martinez, M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z law at gmail.com. Very user friendly. Uh, thank you everyone for uh hosting me having me and uh look forward to working with you along the way sean and having another great steak like we did absolutely. last time you were in New absolutely York. Well, so maybe it'll be in spain all right tony thank you so there much you have a great rest of your day i'm sure we'll be talking down the road okay all right take Res care god bless you everybody take care see everybody well. see everybody tomorrow take care guys bye-bye now